Welcome back you legends, I'm Dr. Khan, let's get right into this video. I missed all of you, happy new year everybody. Uh, I really, really apologize for missing uh, uploads the last three weeks or so. I did not mean to stop uploading videos guys, I just got insanely, insanely busy. I got uh, a bunch of stuff in my personal life that I just had to take care of. My schedule still looks insane, but let's get this video out. Because finally, 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 after a couple of weeks of a really ugly, ugly looking consolidation, we have finally broken out to the upside. Now, Friday was quite the trading session, right? We had 2.5% up on the NASDAQ, 2.1% on the Dow Jones, 2.3% on the S&P 500. Look at this sea of green all over the place. Let's take a look at the stock market map. This is the performance uh, for the year 2022. And uh, notably, look at the tech rec. Apple down 25, Microsoft 29, Google 36.6%, Amazon cut in half, Nvidia, AMD cut in half, Tesla lost more than half of its value. Absolute insanity. The green really is in energy. Energy led throughout 2022. We know energy loves inflation. And so energy soared like crazy. Healthcare also loves inflation because, because really healthcare and education are two of the fastest growing areas outpacing inflation. And so healthcare was a safe bet to uh, shield yourself against inflation. Aerospace and defense did well thanks to the uh, Russian-Ukraine war. And then insurance also did well because of its defensive nature as well as consumer defensives and um, utilities as well. Housing got destroyed, tech got destroyed, banking um, saw massive, massive losses, small payment processors like PayPal and American Express also saw some losses. Home improvement, including Home Depot and Lowe's, both got hit really hard, primarily due to the um, significant rise in mortgage rates. Now, let's take a look at this week's performance, everybody. And uh, we do have a lot of green on here, including financials, communication services, really everything communication services except for Google, semiconductors except for the fastest growing semis, including AMD and on, as well as Nvidia. The rest really did super well. Defensives did okay. Semiconductor equipment and materials did okay. But surprise, surprise, look at this, guys. Healthcare, which was one of the leading sectors last year, took a big, big, big hit as soon as January started. In fact, let's take a look at United Healthcare, because if you notice, guys, look at this December 30th, boom, January 3rd, the first trading day in January immediately broke below this support line, and then we had a waterfall style sell off in United Health that really took down the entire healthcare sector with it. Now, let's take a look at the different sectors for Friday leading were materials, energy defensives and utilities. So again, guys, despite this really beautiful, beautiful green uh, rally, still, what do you notice, guys? Materials, energy, defensives, and utilities, all of the defensive sectors doing well, the risk-off sectors doing well, and uh, cyclicals, communication services, and technology, the risk-on sectors doing very uh, poorly in comparison to the rest of the market. So, even though this might appear to be a really impressive green day, it was actually led by defensive. So we're still squarely in a bear market. Make no mistake about it. Still defensive companies are leading and risk on uh, growth uh, names are still lagging the market. Now for the S&P 500 projections, everybody, I did publish my projections in uh, mid-December, I outlined two possible scenarios. I see two scenarios playing out into the end of the month in the next 10 trading days. Scenario number one is the SPY will continue to sell off all the way down to $375 to fill the gap left from November 9th. I'm talking about this boom gap right here. And then proceed to rally to $390 from there. Scenario number two is the SPY will actually begin to rally first 
and then fill the gap later. Scenario number one is the more likely in my view because it will produce the more violent swings. And it's clear from the VIX regime that volatility is only going to trend up from here. We will be ready to short the 390 move in either case. So I made it very obvious. I was waiting for 390 to short it. I'm still bearish, everybody. I'm not bullish. I'm still bearish in the medium and long term. And I've been waiting for 390 for weeks now since the middle of December. And we are finally getting there. I did update my projections just a couple days after uh, posting them. Boom, everyone, update to SPY projections. We have, we have fulfilled the criteria for scenario number one. So I do post these uh, projections uh, in the trading community. This is the trading community, guys. I do post these projections in the live analysis channel, as well as a live link to the projections chart in my charts right over here. This is the projections chart. I did not update it since uh, the 22nd of December. The fact that it peaks on uh, January the 6th is a total coincidence, guys. It's total coincidence. Um, I was not predicting a top on January 6th. It's just a coincidence. We were looking at a very, very clear pivot zone right over here at $375 to fill this gap. This gap is actually at 374. We came really, really close to filling the gap. We had 375, so that was close enough. We did not quite fill the gap. So we still have unresolved business to attend to at 374, uh, which I suspect we will revisit probably uh, in February. So we did tag this support zone, we bounced off it, we then consolidated for several days, uh, 10 days in fact, let's count them here to here, how many days, uh, 12 bars, so 12 trading days, we've been in this consolidation zone, we finally broke out Friday, and uh, now I'm expecting the market to continue to rally to at least 390, all the way up here guys to around 393 i expect the market to see a lot of uh, major major resistance at this level if we do clear this uh, resistance level i see the market potentially rallying up to 395 i do not see us uh, filling this gap i just simply do not see us filling this gap at this point in time this might change but at this point in time I do not see us filling this gap. I'm going to explain why. Let me show you why. Look at this top. This was the top in August. We uh, left this gap. We tried to rally to fill this gap. We failed in the middle of this uh, gap fill zone. We did not end up filling this gap. Let me show you another one. Right here, guys, April 5th, we left this gap. We tried to fill it. We did fill it intraday but never on a closing basis. And then we ended up never filling this gap on a closing basis. And so in each one of these major, major bear market uh, tops this year, we left a gap and then we never ended up filling the gap on a closing basis. We might see something that looks like this, a spike and then a rejection uh, hitting the 200 day moving average, failing to clear it filling the gap intraday and then rejecting and moving down. I could see that happening on a closing basis at this point in time. I do not see us uh, filling this gap. So for this counter trend rally, I do see the S&P hitting 390, um, moving up slightly over 390 and then getting a lot of resistance at 393 to 395, the top of this candle wick right here. Now, if we see something like that, a rally, we try and we try and we fail at that point in time, just be careful going long, hoping for a gap fill, because just as I showed you guys, these gaps can be left unfilled. So just be careful when trying to play this counter trend bounce. Personally, I will not be participating in this counter trend rally. I do not like to participate in these small counter trend bounces. Uh, I like to trade with the trend. So if the trend does change to the uh, bullish side, I will trade that to the upside. Otherwise, I will stick to trading the trend. Now, we do have this potential crossover on the PPO. If this does end up happening, we could see a slightly longer than expected uptrend that could last into the end of the month. We do have a lot of earnings coming out. 
and we do have the Fed meeting on uh, the 1st of February. But really, between the 1st of February and mid-January, there's not a lot of uh, economic catalyst except for earnings. So it's going to be an earnings-driven market. And in that case, expect a highly volatile, highly news-driven market where technicals could help you, but you have to be careful because it's always going to be driven by big company earnings. So if you have an opinion about company earnings, whether they're going to be stronger or weaker than expected, you can trade the market based on that. That's highly speculative. I do not tend to like to trade earnings a lot. So throughout January, I expect to be very conservative in my trading because, again, I do not like to trade a lot of earnings. Now, since the market put in this top on December 13th, by the way, we did short this top exactly at the top. As soon as the market opened, we did enter a lot of short positions uh, using put spread options on both the S&P 500, that's SPY, as well as the SMH, the Semiconductors Index. Both of these positions are still in the green. I did close out the SMH position and booked 120% uh, profit on that position. I still have my SPY position open because it's significantly more conservative. It's a more conservative position so I can afford to keep it open for longer. And again, if I start to see uh, changes in trend to the upside, I'll be closing out that position and booking my profit. That position as of right now is around 50% in the green. Now, I'll have to say that throughout this consolidation phase, I've been following a lot of institutional traders as well as retail traders and the vast majority of institutional investors and traders were actually bearish during this consolidation phase and they're anticipating a break to the downside for more selling, essentially calling this a bear flag. Now in the trading community, we were uh, suspicious of that. In fact, since mid-December, I've been waiting for this rally to 390, and over the past several days, we've actually seen hints that this rally was coming, that this uh, consolidation uh, zone, this range, would break to the upside, not to the downside. I'm going to explain why uh, that was uh, our assessment, my assessment, and it has to do with some small technical hints as well as some interesting fundamental economic developments. Let's get into the economics first, and we have exhibit number one right here. Uh, ISM manufacturing PMI came in slightly below forecast. Uh, remember guys, PMI below 50 is contractionary, so the economy, at least the manufacturing side of the economy, is contracting slightly. Then we had the jobs, uh, job openings, they came in significantly higher than expected, 10.5 million uh, versus 10.1 million expected. Then we had the FOMC minutes. The FOMC minutes were significantly more bearish than the market anticipated. The Fed was talking about no rate cuts at all throughout this year and at least two interest rate uh, hikes this year of uh, 25 basis points at least. Uh, so 25 and 25 in February and uh, in March, which would amount to a uh, half a percentage point at least this year with no rate cuts throughout 2023. So that was uh, bearish. Then we had the ADP employment change with a forecast of 150,000. And then we added 235,000 jobs based on the ADP employment change report. Again, bearish indicating inflation, strong jobs market, more jobs openings, etc. So everything was looking bearish. And whilst everything was looking bearish, I did notice something very suspicious happening with the Dow theory model. Now, guys, up top is the Dow Jones Industrials and down below is the Dow Transports. This is my Dow theory model chart. I uh, look at it to identify divergences either to the upside or to the downside. So, so either bearish or bullish divergences. And I noticed something fascinating. Look at this. Down below is the Dow Transports. The Dow Transports have been putting in successive higher lows, even though the Dow Industrials were moving sideways 
and putting in slightly lower lows throughout last week. Now, this did alert me that the market was actually underneath all of it was actually bullish. They were looking to buy ahead of uh, the uh, unemployment rate that came out Friday. Now, the unemployment rate came uh, below expectations, 3.5%, which typically would be seen as bearish uh, because uh, the Fed is targeting at least 5 to 5.5% unemployment by the end of this year to combat core inflation and wage growth. As long as the jobs market is strong, wages will continue to spiral up, pushing core inflation, that is wages, rents, etc., up and that will make uh, the Fed's job even harder. So what happened was unemployment came in below expectations, which was bearish, but then non-farm payrolls came in within expectations. We did not add as many jobs as the ADP employment change uh, report suggested that we would. And then we had this, look at this, average hourly earnings down from a uh, an expected 5% uh, growth year on year to 4.6. That's significantly below expectation. And this number really was what drove the market up. Yes, unemployment came down, but wage uh, growth slowed down significantly more than expected. And that's why the market rallied. That's exactly why the market rallied. Very interestingly, I was actually expecting something that looked somewhat like this. I did expect the non-farm payrolls to come in within expectations or slightly lower. And that's uh, due to one specific reason. And that's because these numbers are cooked. These numbers are cooked, guys. We all know the non-farm payrolls are cooked. ADP employment change, I trust this number more than I trust this number. And I was expecting them to cook the numbers, which in a month's time, we will know whether they cook the numbers because they tend to adjust these numbers every month. So next month, we might see that this number was adjusted up. Yeah, guys, I'm sorry we added more jobs than what we reported. Uh, sorry, inflation is still high, etc. whatever. So the JOLTS job openings, as well as the ADP employment change, both indicated a hot jobs market. But then Friday, which was the pivotal point in time that we were all expecting, the opposite happened, right? Average hourly earnings came in below expectations. Unemployment rate came below expectations. But that didn't matter because average hourly earnings growth declined significantly. Here it is, guys. I put out a note on January 5th, Thursday at 6.29 p.m. I'm at UTC plus 3, so this is about 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time. Something fascinating is happening. I haven't seen this in a long while. Dow Industrials up top and Dow Transports down below. There's a clear positive divergence that's been developing for days. The transports have led the Dow down for the entirety of 2022. I am now seeing the opposite with the transports potentially leading the Dow up. We may be due for a rally soon. I put out this note just before uh, that Friday um, econ drop. And then I followed up with this. This is the weekly chart for the SPX. Notice how we have now rejected sell-offs once, twice, three times, forming a higher low each time right at the 38% Fibonacci retracement level. So we may start the year with a rally here. I am now thinking about taking profit on both of my SPY and SMH shorts just to be safe. And I did end up closing out my SMH short position and booking a 120% profit on that position. This is the update that I posted 30 minutes after the market opened on uh, Friday. Something I've learned over the years is that you do not want to short the market as it tags support ahead of a key event just as you do not want to buy the market as it tags resistance ahead of a key event. I am happy I remained disciplined and took off my NVIDIA and SMH shorts yesterday. I would still be happy had the market crashed today because I could just go back in. We have to remain exceptionally disciplined this month as we begin to understand the market's character in 2023. Each year is different and we need some time to navigate this new environment, pick up on its clues and read it the best we can. 
And here it is, guys. This is the support line that I was watching. Let's take a look at the two-hour chart. Look at this, guys. Tagged once, twice, three times, nearly three times, four times. We sat right on top of it ahead of that key uh, econ drop on Friday. Then the market uh, gapped up. It retraced down. This is common, guys. This happens a lot on major econ days. In fact, let me show you a few other examples. This is an example uh, when... Um, we had that CPI release, the market gapped up massively. It went down by uh, about uh, a couple of dollars on the SPY. Then it continued to move back up. So this is common. Let me show you another example here, guys. Another CPI release, we gapped up. We uh, moved down a couple of dollars and then we continued to rally. So this was somewhat to be expected, right? It was deeper than uh, most would have anticipated, right? This retracement was quite substantial on the 10 uh, minute chart. This was a substantial retracement, but then we had a V-shaped recovery. We flagged, we broke out and formed a higher intraday high, taking out this prior high, and then we established this uptrend. Now, with that said, I did take profit in my shorts. I did not add longs. I do not, again, I do not plan to trade this to the upside unless the trend changes uh, to the bullish side. Otherwise, I do not plan on uh, trading these counter trend rallies because overall, they're just not always worth trading, to be honest. If the trend is down, do not fight the trend, short the rips and take profit on the dips. That's what we did. We shorted this rip, we took profit on this dip, and then we'll do the same over the next few weeks. Now, I do follow cycle analysis, guys, and Ask Slim, guys, if you do not know about Ask Slim, he's, in my opinion, one of the best cycle analysts out there, and he's now projecting a rally into the 390s on the SPY into mid-January, which is what I was expecting as well, and uh, then a dip into early February with another attempted rally. Now, with cycle analysis, guys, if you look at cycles, market cycles, what you want uh, to pay very close attention to is making new lows or new highs in a given cycle versus the prior cycle. So if we, uh, so if we take that and apply it and we say that the market rallies and forms something that looks like this, and then it begins to dip into... Uh, early February, we will be watching whether this low holds or whether this low is taken out. Now, if this low does hold and then we make something that looks like this, a higher low, we can actually anticipate that this high could be taken out with another rally and the market taking out this resistance line with another rally forming a slightly higher high. That could happen. I'm not in favor of uh, this forecast. In my opinion, we will see something that looks like this, right? Shoulder, head, another shoulder, rejection here. We do not take out this resistance line. And then we take out this prior support area, forming a new low, and we continue to sell off into March and potentially April. So that's my forecast as of right now. In fact, let's let's flesh this out. Let me put in a um, trend line right over here to take a look at this potential head and shoulders formation. Now, let me copy this trend line. Let's put this trend line up there. Boom. This is what I'm expecting. Shoulder, head, another shoulder, and boom, failure right here potentially or even lower than that, failing to fill this gap. So that's what I'm anticipating. We'll see if that happens or not. A bullish crossover on the PPO would allow this rally to continue for a little while longer or perhaps to see something that looks like this, a rally, then consolidation, 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 and a failure. And then, and then we move back down, something that looks a little bit like this. Now, in terms of next week, I do want to talk about a couple of really interesting developments. Number one, Tuesday, we'll have Fed Chair Powell speaking 30 minutes before the market open. So expect a bunch of volatility to slap the market right in the face. And then Wednesday, uh, nothing really happening. Then uh, Thursday, inflation, CPI core and headline inflation. Now, let me say this right off the bat. I expect this inflation number to be uh, lower than expected. I expect this inflation figure to come in lower than forecast, and I expect the market to like this inflation figure. In my opinion, inflation is coming down. I think fears of inflation are slowly, slowly shifting to 
fears of recession and global economic growth slowing down. So that's what I'm seeing in the market. I'm seeing gold getting bid up. I'm seeing TLT, long-term treasuries, getting bid. I'm seeing yields uh, topping. In fact, we called the top on the 10-year yield last year. Here it is, guys, the U.S. 10-year yield. In fact, we anticipated this exact moment, this exact moment of this massive, massive break on November 10th with the massive, massive, massive rally on November 10th, which funnily enough happened on the CPI release. We were actually anticipating this massive rally to the upside and that massive break on the 10-year yield. And that is exactly what happened. We had this uh, head and shoulders topping formation. We broke below the neckline on CPI, massive breakdown, massive rally in the market. And yet again, guys, we had another target. We were looking at 3.9%. I talked about this target, I think, in my last video. And I talked a lot about it in the um, uh, trading community. And we tagged 3.9. So it's going to be really interesting to see whether the next inflation report takes out this uh, support level right here. If that does end up happening, I expect the SPY to rally really handsomely. And now here's what I expect could happen next week, could happen, right? We have Papa Powell coming out 9 a.m. Uh, Tuesday. So Monday, we could see some inside trading day. We could see perhaps a push to 390, nothing major. I do not uh, expect uh, a big, big move, um, perhaps a gap up, something that looks like this, an indecision doji or a small body candle, whatever, nothing major. I do not expect something major Monday. But then Tuesday, we could see something that looks like this, a big, 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 big sell-off on Jay Powell, on Hawkish Powell. We go back to retest this support line and we form a um, tombstone Topping pattern, something that looks like this, right? Massive rally, indecision or small candle, massive sell-off. We are set on top of this support line. Everybody thinks the market is going to break down. CPI is coming in hot, etc., etc. And then the opposite happens. We gap up and then we take out 390 and we have a big old rally. Now, I could see the market playing out that way. That way makes a lot of sense to me because it will shake out the most amount of traders. And if I've learned anything over the years is that the market is evil, at least that's how you want to think about it to protect yourself. Just think about the most outrageous, the most really vile and evil way the market can trade and uh, be ready for it. And in my opinion, this would be the most vile way the market will shake out traders, right? Everybody goes long here, long, 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 rah, 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 rally. Then we get a small uh, rally Monday. Papa Powell comes out Tuesday. We get a gap down. We sell off massively. We squat right on top of the support line yet again. And then CPI comes out and then we rip to the upside in a face ripping rally. That could happen on a scale of 1 to 10. 1 being a uh, forgiving market and 10 being an evil, nasty market. This would be a 10. This, this would be an evil, nasty market that just wants to shake out people. And so I think it is possible, very plausible, in fact. But let's take it one step at a time, okay? I could be completely wrong about this, guys. This is just uh, my way of thinking about it, to be prepared uh, for massive shakeouts. That's just my way of really managing risk is to think about these uh, kinds of uh, things and just be prepared if we get a massive dump and then we rally. Alternatively, guys, we could actually do the opposite, right? We could rally to 390 and then dump on CPI. That's also possible. One way to look at it is always be prepared for the day before CPI. What I'd like to see is something that looks like this. A big, big dump ahead of CPI. That tells me the market is bearish. And um, usually when that happens, we see the opposite reaction the day after and a massive rally. Same thing happened here, guys. Take a look at this. Uh, market was pretty bearish. We had this topping tail. We had another sell-off and then we had a massive rally on CPI. So that's what I want to see. I want to see the market being bearish ahead of CPI. If you want to see a rally, if you want to see the opposite, if you want to see a crash on CPI, you want to see the market uh, going euphoric, something that looks like this, right? And then uh, reality slaps the market right in the face and we get a massive dump.
Now, there's a reason the market trades this way, guys, and it has to do with the options market. Market makers are net option sellers. They write options and they sell them. And the way they make money is by you buying the option and then selling it back to them at a loss. And so if you are bullish, let's say, uh, going into CPI, then you buy, let's say here, the market rallies, and then you see a massive dump ahead of CPI. You get scared, you sell your option at a loss, market makers uh, book their profits, and then the market shoots to the upside. That's how the options market really remains efficient is it tries to make you sell at a loss, right? So even if the market is rallying, even if CPI is good, you see this uh, dump ahead of CPI, you get scared, you sell, then the market rips. The opposite, right, happens here. The market rallies, rallies, rallies. You buy anticipating a massive uh, face ripping rally. Then you get a, a bad CPI read and the market dumps. So that's just a small note on how a market psychology works. Now, we talked about my SPY projections I talked about next week. Let's talk a little bit about the weekly SPX chart and what happened in 2022, right? We had the top right here in early January. As soon as this break happened, I immediately realized that this is over. In fact, not even, not even uh, at this break. In fact, I came to the realization that the bull market was over right here at this break. Now, the market did not top until uh, about a month later, but the NASDAQ actually did top in November, and then was trading the NASDAQ. And here's why I saw the end of the bear market when this happened. Let me show you what happened with the VIX. Here it is, guys. This is the VIX chart. Let me show you what was going on with the VIX as the um, NASDAQ was topping. Now, guys, up top is the VIX and down below in the uh, blue and black is the NASDAQ. And the NASDAQ did top November 22nd, right here. Uh, the SPY actually, let's take a look. I think rejected off 300 and, uh, excuse me, 470, uh, right? Yes, 473, it rejected. We had this double top with negative diversions. And then something super interesting happened. This was November 24th. And uh, right towards the end of November, seasonality dictates that the market should have rallied. And what happened was the opposite. We had this massive, massive crash on November 22nd. Now, this was a 2.2% uh, decline in a single day on the SPY which is not a lot if you talk about 2022, but in 2021, this was significant, especially in November, a low volume time of the year. Look at this, low volume, low volume, low volume. Then boom, spike in volume, boom, boom, several massive spikes in volume and a significant, significant correction after months and months and months of these small, small dips, we had this bigger dip in September and late October, which according to seasonality was expected, right? In fact, we traded this uh, rally to the upside and I believe I made, uh, I think 10X on AMD, 10X on Nvidia and 15X trading Coinbase options. Uh, I got in exactly at the bottom and I exited exactly at the top. I got super lucky with those trades. There were smaller trades though, except for AMD, which was, I think about, I think I closed it at $700,000 was, it was an $80,000 trade that I closed at 760,000. So it's actually one of, uh, one of my earliest documented trades on Reddit. And at that point I went 100% cash. I closed all of my positions. I went 100% cash and was actually waiting for another rally to uh, potentially 500 uh, on the SPY. But then this happened. And I keep talking about this because it's, it's very important because these small hints are what alerts us to a massive, massive change in the stock market regime. Look at this. The VIX was moving up even though the market was rallying. The VIX was actually moving up. So even though the market was making new highs, new all-time highs, the VIX was making higher lows, indicating that market participants were actually 
opening puts they were turning bearish at this point in time in late november and then we had this massive massive shake off this black friday crash and volatility spiked massively in fact i took a look at the options chain for the vix on thursday now if you if you want to trade the vix you can do it many ways you can do uh, futures you can do options on the vix or options on vix etns like the vxx and uh, uvxy and so i took a look at options for the vxx thursday and then friday and what told me that this was a game changer was that options went up 500 times meaning if you put in a thousand dollars Friday, excuse me, Thursday, and then you close the option Friday, you would have made $500,000 on a $1,000 trade. That, that just told me everything. That told me that volatility is here to stay, and volatility at uh, all-time highs tells me that the market was topping, and that was it. That's how I uh, completely closed out all of my long positions, and... Uh, how I, uh, I actually was sitting on 100% cash in one in my $1 million portfolio. And that was really all she wrote for 2021. That was the top for the triple Qs. The S&P managed to edge in a slightly higher high in early January. And that was it. We had this waterfall sell-off. And at that point in time, pretty much everybody... Um, realized that the bear market has started and that the top was in and that was it we began selling off and i traded this move to the upside i traded this move to the upside i traded this move to the upside and i traded this move to the upside and was short for the rest of the move down now if we take a look at a monthly chart for 2021 you will notice something peculiar that happened after we put in the october low look at this guys boom we made a high here the market continued to sell off and if you notice look at the five month moving average we haven't closed above it once once until the october bottom right we had the sell-off we rallied we came close to closing above it we failed we opened above it we sold off sold off sold off we rallied, we failed to close above it, we had this rally, intra-month rally, then we closed below it, again closing below it, and then this happened. We had the October bottom, we closed above it, then we closed above it again in November, we had this massive, massive double bottom on the weekly chart with a positive divergence. I talked about this a lot. If you go to my earlier videos, I talked a lot about this. We called the bottom exactly on the day. We got really, really lucky in calling the bottom here. We went long. We rode this move to the upside. We traded it to the upside. And then again, we called the top. Again, we got really lucky in calling the top December 13th. And we've been short since now something interesting is happening throughout 2022 the fed was raising rates yields were exploding and stock market valuations were collapsing in response to rising yield okay that made it for an easy tradable bear market you know the uh, the fed is raising rates you know yields are moving up that means valuations are going to collapse especially on the high growth names namely the nasdaq so it was an easy short to short the nasdaq now we know that the terminal rate for the federal funds rate is going to top at around five to five and a half percent this year with the average expected uh rate hike uh being uh half a percentage point two 25 basis points once in february and once in march two interest rate hikes uh, both 25 basis points so that's half a percentage point so what happens from there we simply do not know if the fed is going to continue to raise rates after five and a half the likelihood of that happening is very low because the u.s treasury will basically go bankrupt at that rate that's just too much to handle the u.s is in deep 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 debt and so it's simply not feasible and so what is going to drive the next uh, sell-off has to be weakening economic growth recession basically we need to see a recession for the market to continue to sell off now the difference between uh, interest rate hikes right 
where we know the Fed is going to uh, raise interest rates, where the Fed, Jay Powell, basically choreographs every rate hike. We know what the Fed is going to do weeks in advance of every uh, Fed meeting, basically. And so that makes for an easy market to trade. We are trading within a beautiful, beautiful descending channel. We reject at the 200 once, twice. It, it's basically easy trading. Now it's significantly harder in 2023. We simply cannot choreograph economic recession. It's impossible. They always, always come uh, all of a sudden in massive, massive declines, just like the 2008 crash, right? We had that massive, massive uh, 2008 uh, crash, the majority of which occurred in a span. Let's take a look at this, guys. This massive crash happened within 30 days. 30 days, the majority of the crash happened in a month. And if we take a look at the 2000 uh, internet bubble crashes, they all happened super fast, right? Look at this. 55 days, massive crash. Another one, massive crash in 50 days. Another one right here, massive crash, 70 days. So they happened usually... So they usually happen within a month or two. The market slowly, slowly moves down, then crashes massively. Then it recovers, moves slowly down, then it crashes all of a sudden. And so this is a significantly harder environment to trade. And that's the environment that we are entering in 2023. We are going to see wild, wild swings uh, this year. Massive swings. We could see the weekly chart turning significantly more bullish. We could see a lot of crazy things. And then the market suddenly crashes. So it's a much, much, much more challenging environment to trade. That's why I said that we have to be exceptionally disciplined this month to try and read the market. Now, with all of that being said, take a look at this, guys. We had this um, shooting star candle. We had a long wick. We rejected the sell-off. Another smaller candle rejected the sell-off at a higher low. And then another sell-off. We rejected the sell-off with a higher low, all occurring at the 38% Fibonacci retracement level. And so we are seeing this rounded bottoming formation setting us up for a nice counter trend rally. Again, I'm anticipating around 390 to 395 or thereabouts on the SPY. Then all bets are off from that point on. Now, objectively speaking, if you take a look at the weekly chart, we had a double bottom, lower low on the weekly chart, and a higher low on the PPO. So momentum was turning more bullish. So a lot of technicians. We'll see this and we'll start thinking about going long. A lot will unfortunately mistakenly think that the market has bottomed here. That's just not my opinion. I, I do not believe this is the bottom at all. We have never, never had a bear market bottom before a recession. The recession hits and then the bear market bottoms. We do not bottom before the bear market, before the recession, right? The recession has to hit first. Then we have to see a massive waterfall sell-off. We have to see a massive spike in the VIX and then the bear market bottoms. So this is not the bottom in my opinion. This could be an intermediate uh, term bottom, a medium term bottom where we could see something that looks like this, a lot of chop, a lot of sideways moves, right? A lot of sideways moves and then boom, a massive, massive, massive sell-off in the second half of the year. That's possible. Now, what's going to be key to all of this is this resistance line. As long as this resistance line holds, uh, the market will respect this descending channel. So as long as this resistance line holds, we could trade based on this descending channel, right? Buying puts, for example, into June, into March, something like that. Buying spreads, anticipating uh, a decline following this channel until we get that massive uh, waterfall style sell-off, perhaps in the second half of the year. Uh, what will shake things up is that if we uh, take out this uh, resistance line, unfortunately, at that point, this descending channel will no longer be reliable. So I'm hoping that we respect this resistance line because otherwise it's going to make it exceptionally difficult to trade uh, this market this year. Now, the Fed has been raising rates throughout 2022, and uh, these rate hikes take anywhere between a year to 18 months to see effect, and they started to raise rates in March. So we could see uh, the ramifications of those interest rate hikes uh, begin sometime in um, June into October. Uh, that's when I actually expect uh, 
uh, the recession to begin heading really hard to see uh, uh, layoffs, to see significant uh, contraction in GDP. That's my expectation at this point, the earnings at this uh, month and next month. 2022 earnings coming out this month are going to give us a lot of insight into how strong or weak the economy is and how fast this decline could come. So 2022 has been the year of the bear. The bears have been having a massive party, right? Counting their money. By the way, guys, both of these images have actually been generated by an RAI generator in the trading community. I do have uh, an AI art generator in the trading community, which is completely free uh, to use by any member. You can use it to uh, type in whatever, uh, whatever you want on the, on the and the AI will make that uh, image for you. For example, for this image, one of the members actually wrote uh, bears having a party <laughs> and the AI made this uh, image. Same thing here, guys. Uh, uh, bear Mafia, I, I believe the member wrote in Bear Mafia counting money or playing cards, uh, something like that. And this image was made. Now for 2022, guys, uh, I do want to read this post from Tom. Tom wrote to me, thanks, uh, Cal, for some of your free videos. I couldn't believe your uh, projections. I made great decisions on turning points, August 17th, September 13th, and October 13th regarding short or long, but I sold too early, so I joined your community two weeks ago. And he posted his returns. His, his returns were absolutely exceptional. Congratulations, Tom. He made 8.5% per month. By the way, guys, 8.5%, an 8.5% return Per month is absolutely exceptional. 8.5% is what you would expect to make in a year. He was making uh, 11%, 20%, 20%, double digit uh, gains really uh, since the middle of the year. Uh, according to him, following my videos, I've been uploading videos, I believe since uh, I think late June, um, early July, something like that. And um, if you've been following my videos, I did actually call the top here, I called the bottom here, and I called the top here. And um, in all three cases, I got super lucky. I actually caught the top exactly on the day uh, on all of three of these. Uh, the exact day, October 13th, the exact day, December 13th, the exact day, uh, right here, August 16th. So I got lucky in all of these. Obviously, I was just reading the charts and following the technicals. Uh, getting the exact day is almost impossible. So this, so that was pure luck. Uh, but you can time the bottom. In my opinion, bottoms and tops, you can time them based on technicals. Uh, to within a few days, that is possible in my opinion. We've done it, right? And if you traded, uh, if you traded short at the top and then you traded long at the bottom and then you shorted again, you will have made uh similar returns using ETFs, similar returns to Tom using ETFs, inverse ETFs like SQQQ, S triple Q, and T triple Q. So if you went long and short at these pivotal points you will have made similar returns to Tom. Now, I do want to point out some exceptional returns. Uh, this legend uh, made a thousand percent just in the last quarter. This is an exceptional uh, quarterly return. That's why I wanted to share. This is not typical at all, guys. I'm not saying that you can make a thousand percent in a quarter uh, a trading ETFs or things like that. You will have to be uh, taking on a substantial amount of risk, either trading uh, futures or options or something like that. Um, but that, the, but that is an exceptional return, a thousand percent, absolutely incredible. Congratulations! By the way, guys, this a channel, the Game Porn channel, is a public channel. You can go into my Discord and you can go into this channel, and you will get a glimpse into both the gains and the losses of the members. Some members do post losses, other members do post gains. I did run a poll. Uh, at the end of the year, just to uh, figure out where we are. To start the year, I wanted to run a poll to see how we've done so far. If you're up since joining the Money Time Machine family, uh, just click on green. If you're down, click on uh, uh, red. And so we had 309 members uh, saying that they came up green over uh, 2022. 150 members uh, were down on the year. 35 members broke even. That's roughly uh, 2 to 1, so about 70%. Um, made a profit in 2022, uh, about 30% were down for a year where the S&P 500 was down more than 20%. That's actually exceptional. That is an exceptional return. Let's take a look at this, guys. Yes, the S&P, there we go. The S&P was down uh, just about 20% in 2022. So uh, 
a two to one split where twice as many people made money versus uh, lost money. That's an exceptional result. Obviously, I hate seeing people lose money. So even though 70% made money, 30% did lose money. And I'm hoping for 2023 uh, to make it a four to one. So 80% making money, 20% perhaps uh, making a loss or breaking even. That's my goal for this year, hopefully. Obviously, guys, this percentage will never be 100%. You will never have 100% uh, of folks making money, especially in a down market. It's just impossible. An 80-20 split, a 4-1 to one split. I'll be super happy with that for 2023. So uh, fingers crossed we get there and we improve this year. Now, let's take a look at the Dow Jones. Interestingly, I was, uh, again, I talked about this descending uh, resistance line a lot in the trading community and in the uh, YouTube channel in November. At this point right here, I actually went on a limb and uh, said that I expect the uh, Dow Jones to actually take out this resistance line. And it did. In fact, I went on a limb and said that the SPY will do the same. Now, the S&P did take out the resistance line but it was only intraday and it formed this double top, right? So it was uh, significantly weaker than the uh, Dow Jones. The Dow was significantly stronger than the S&P. We took out this resistance line and we are now bouncing off the 200-day moving average. This is a significant development, right? And even the PPO is curling over and crossing over, nearly crossing over, at the zero line. So this is significant. If you take a look at this period right here, look at this rally, a rejection, small rejection. We broke through, we retraced, and then we are rallying again off this 200 day moving average. If you look at this in a vacuum, this is clearly a bull market, right? If you look at this in a vacuum, it's a bull market. And overall, in 2022, the Dow has led the S&P and the Nasdaq. It's been uh, the best performing out of the three. And so obviously, when conditions improve and when uh, we start to see risk appetite growing in the market, uh, the Dow is expected to outperform the rest of the market, including the S&P and the Nasdaq. And so if you want to trade this move to the upside, I would do it through the Dow. I would do it uh, through ETFs like VTV. That's personally what I would do. If you want to stick to shorting the market, personally, I'm just focused on shorting the weakest parts of the market, including the NASDAQ and tech companies in general. I also short the S&P uh, just because it's an easier uh, ETF to analyze and do technical analysis on. Uh, that's why I short the S&P uh, sometimes over the NASDAQ. That's really the only reason. It's because of uh, technical analysis. It's easier to perform technical analysis. The S&P respects technical analysis a lot more than the NASDAQ or the Dow. Now, if we take a look at the Dow, right, we had uh, br this breakthrough. This is a significant breakthrough of the resistance line. Uh, we rallied, we had this rounded top. We had an even higher intraday high here, even though the PPO was curling over. We uh, hugged the 50-day moving average. We uh, traded above the 200-day moving average, and now we are again rallying. Now, this does not mean by any means that the bear market overall is over. If you want to judge whether the bear market is over or not, you will have to take a look at the S&P 500, not the NASDAQ, not the triple Qs, and not the Dow. In fact, let me take a look at the S&P 500 right now, guys. I do want to point out something very significant. If we go back all the way to 2000, because remember, guys, the 2000 bear market is very similar to this bear market. We had this massive bubble. The bubble burst. The bear market lasted for uh, years and years and years. It lasted three years before putting in a bottom. I expect the S&P uh, bear market uh, this year will likely last into the end of the year. That's my anticipation. I don't know if, if it's going to last into 2024. I do not know, but I think that it will continue into at least the end of the year. What I want to point out is that the S&P at one point in the 2001, uh, excuse me, 2002 bear market, we had this double rejection of the 200-day moving average. Then we sold off. We had a double bottom, a positive divergence. The market rallied, took out the 200-day moving average, traded above it for several weeks. And then the 50-day moving average, this green line came in super close, super close 
to crossing above the 200 day moving average. Now, in my view, the, the uh, bear market is not over until the 200, excuse me, until the 50 day moving average crosses above the uh, 200 day moving average exactly like this. This was the point at which the bear market was officially over in uh, May of 2003. We had already formed a triple bottom formation with significantly higher lows on the PPO and this beautiful, beautiful final bottom, double bottom, boom, lower low on the price action, higher low on the PPO. This was the perfect entry to time the market. Massive, massive, massive green days. Uh, look at this, guys. Green, 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 green. Look at this. Absolutely insane. This was the pivot that everybody was waiting for and the market just rallied and we had a new bull market from that point on, officially, officially starting on um, May 20th. Now, funnily enough, guys, look at this. The 50-day moving average is ascending. The 200-day moving average is descending. And at some point uh, in time throughout this period in January, February, March, these two will come super close to crossing over and the bear market, in my view, will not end. The 50-day will come super close to crossing over. It will fail to cross over and the bear market will continue. We'll see uh, selling continue at that point on. Simply, guys, because the real curve is now predicting a 100% chance of recession. We raised rates into a weakening economy. We're talking about 5% on the federal fund rate in 2023. That's absolute insanity into a weakening economy, super high inflation. I simply do not believe that the uh, economy will survive. It, it just can't. That's just my opinion at this point. It may change in the future, but that's my opinion at this point in time. I simply believe the 50-day will fail to cross over, or if, even if it crosses over, I just do not see the bear market ending. Uh, I simply see the, an extension of a period of consolidation, a kangaroo-style market perhaps, and then massive, massive selling in the second half of the year. Now, my projections, guys, into March is that we will see around $320 on the SPY into March, uh, which is $3,200 on the SPX, uh, bouncing off this uh, Fibonacci retracement level in late March, perhaps into April, that's possible. So we could see something that looks like this, right? If we don't see that into March, then think about a June uh, uh, summer style sell-off as more and more companies report earnings, Q2 earnings and Q1 earnings. Now let's take a look at the triple Qs, significantly weaker than the Dow. Look at this, the Dow making a higher high versus this high in August, while the NASDAQ completely failing, retesting this uh, bottom, this October bottom three times now. And we're now seeing a double bottom, small double bottom, and a uh, small bounce back up. Look at this. We had this double bottom right here, significantly higher low on the PPO, and we're now rallying. I do expect this rally to see significant resistance. Boom, 275, and again at 280, 279, around these levels. This is a pivot zone, a critical pivot zone. We bounced off it twice. It will act as resistance now. This is another pivot zone that we rejected uh, before. We could see another rejection here, something that looks like this right rally rejection uh small pullback another rally massive rejection of this uh descending resistance line and continuation of the selling now i do want to point out this chart as well this is our pal the triple q's divided by the spy demonstrates the danger of false breaks this is what i was talking about in the last video these false these false breaks always lead to waterfall sell-offs look at this guy i posted this december 15th intraday let's take a look at the s p 500 on december 15th this was it, December 15th. We broke below these major support uh, levels on the S&P. And then on the triple Qs divided by the SPY. Look at this, guys. I was talking about this false break. We had this triangle, uh, this symmetrical triangle looking uh, bear pennant. We broke above it uh, massively in intraday on uh, December 13th on that CPI release. Then we completely reversed. We tried to uh, move back above it. We failed, and once that uh, failure happened, uh, at that point, I would at that point I expected a waterfall style sell off. That's exactly what happened. Look at this massive waterfall style sell off, and we're now flagging it again. We now have this bear flag, this bear flag with a small double bottom 
on the uh, two hour chart on this ratio chart we can also see this a positive divergence so expect this to try and rally at least at least back 2.7 this ratio chart so the nasdaq to outperform the smp at least for a little bit maybe for a week or two something like that and then fail once again and move back down Again, guys, if you want to support me, if you want to support the work that I do, if you want to keep up to date with all of my work, all of my charts, everything that I do, all of my trades, you can do so by joining the trading community. You will find the link in the description below. It's $35 a month if you go for the annual Ghost Legend membership. If you want to try out just for a month, you can do uh, that. It's about $50 a month if you want to try out for a month. If you like it, you can then go for the annual membership and get that 30% discount and you won't miss any of my work all of my charts that you see in the videos I post those in my charts a live link to each one of those including my proprietary indicators based on the CPC and PC buy and sell a protocol ratio signals as well as my Dow theory model chart my daily S&P Nasdaq and Dow Jones charts my VIX analysis, all of that stuff, guys, is in my charts. I also post a live analysis pretty much every single day, intraday, pre-market, and sometimes uh, sometimes pre-market, sometimes post-market, in addition to intraday analysis, depending on what's happening with e the econ drops, uh, things like CPI, Fed uh, speeches, etc. I cover those live. I also post all of my investment ideas in investment ideas, my weekly watch list where I post uh, the weekly expected moves, for uh, about a dozen different products, including the S&P, the NASDAQ, the IWM, which is the Brussels 2000, AMD, NVIDIA, uh, Apple, Microsoft, Google, all of those uh, companies, I post the weekly expected moves in the watch list. There are over a dozen different uh, rooms, including the legendary trading room where our best le uh, legendary traders also share their trades live. We have a lot of exceptionally talented traders, so you will stand to learn a lot from those members, uh, I know I've learned a lot from a lot of our exceptionally talented uh, legendary members. Again, guys, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for uh, your incredible support on YouTube as well as the Discord training community. Thank you so much, guys, for your legendary support throughout 2022, and hopefully we'll make 2023 even better. By the way, guys, I do intend to upload videos regularly. It was not intentional uh, this past uh, three weeks. I just, I just simply had a lot on my plate in my personal life. I, don't wanna bo I do not want to bore you with the details. I really love making the videos. It's honestly not about uh, getting bored of the videos or anything like that. I truly enjoy making the videos and sharing with you guys, especially those who simply cannot uh, join the Discord uh, community, maybe because they don't like Discord, maybe they just can't afford it. Uh, I, I really love making the videos for you guys, and um, I plan to continue uploading videos, hopefully at a more regular interval going forward. Now, uh, I talked about the VIX, uh, the top information in the VIX, and I went on a tangent, apologies about that. Now, here's why uh, this was an important development in the VIX in uh, late 2021, guys. It's because at this point in time, is when I realized a new VIX regime was beginning. Because look at this, guys. We had a massive, massive close, uh, eclipsing all of these prior closes on the VIX since May. So that was a major development. It told me that a massive correction was coming, and that the top is likely in, especially with the Fed at that point, talking about potentially beginning to raise interest rates in early 2022, as well as ending the accommodative uh, policies. Now, why am I talking about uh, this? Because look at this, guys. We have this massive, massive uh, decline in volatility. We had this a bullish crossover on the PPO in the VIX as we put in a bottom in volatility. This was about a week ahead of that market top on uh, December 13th. We had this market top December 13th on the SPY. In fact, let me add the S&P on here, guys, so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, boom, there it is. The market topped right over here. We had a double top formation, significantly higher high on the VIX versus here, and significantly lower high on the PPO right over here. Again, alerting us that, yes, this is the top. It's time to short the market. That's why I went full ham uh, and deployed, I think, how much did I deploy? I believe I deployed around $120,000 in put options at that point. That's a massive, massive position for me. And I did take profits 
uh, along the way down. I did I, I, I did close a lot of those positions and booked a lot of uh, profit on those positions. Now, interestingly, guys, usually what happens after a VIX bottom is that we get a retest, something that looks like this, a double bottom, positive divergence, boom, right here, higher low, higher, uh, higher low versus here, double bottom, and then a massive sell-off ensues, right? Let me show you uh, every single time this happened uh, in 2022. Look at this double bottom, higher low on the PPO, massive sell-off. Look at this double bottom, higher low on the PPO, massive sell-off, double bottom, higher low, massive sell-off. But then this year, something different happened. We had a double bottom, we had a spike in the VIX, then we just moved sideways. So this tells me that this is a new VIX regime. This is a new regime, and it indicates to me that complacency is back. We could see the Dow continue to rally, continue to lead, make new highs. The S&P uh, test this resistance line yet again. That's all possible. That's all within the realm of possibility, simply because the VIX is telling me we have a new regime of complacency. The market simply does not believe that the Fed will maintain a rates. They are betting on the Fed pivoting in the middle of the year due to a worsening financial conditions, and they're betting that uh, that pivot will lead the market higher. Now, I don't know about that, guys. I'm not in that camp. I'm not bullish. I'm still bearish. I think even if the Fed pivots, it will be too late. The damage has already been done. If we take a look at 2000, the 2000 bear market, as well as the 2008 bear market, even after the Fed pivot, the market still collapsed because the Fed tends to pivot too late. They were too late to fight inflation and they will be too late to pivot. That's just my view. I do not trust the Fed at all. They were the reason that we are in this mess and now we're supposed to believe that they are competent enough to take us out of it. I just don't see it, guys. I think the market will continue to go down. So I'm just going to continue to short these rallies. The VIX is just telling us to be mindful to perhaps expect periods of uh, consolidation, uh, prolonged periods of consolidation, perhaps even a decline in the VIX and a rally in the market before the next crash. That's all possible. Keep that in mind. We have a new VIX regime this year. Let's take a look at the HYG, our friend, the smart money up top. In the dumb money down below, we have this massive, massive rally in uh, the smart money. Since we put in that bottom on December 28th, we were tracking uh, this divergence. Uh, this is a positive divergence. And again, this is one of the many hints that we were uh, talking about, potentially uh, breaking us up out of this uh, consolidation zone when a lot of people were expecting a breakdown. We were actually expecting a break up. Again, the 10-year yield, we were expecting 3.9%. It's not magic, everybody. It's just the technicals. We had the declining 50-day, and then we had this a bear flag. This was simply a logical level to look at, 3.9%. We did hit it, and then we reversed. This was a great, this was a great buying opportunity for TLT. I was watching TLT and gold at this level to enter. It just came in about a dollar short of my entry target, was, which was 98.5 on the TLT. It got down to 99.5, so I did not enter, unfortunately. Uh, I will uh, continue to wait for that opportunity. I still believe that it is coming. Look at this massive, massive rally in gold. This is gold. We had a couple of, in fact, four times we had this golden cross, this beautiful, beautiful crossover on the PPO. After every one of those, we did have a nice rally in the um, in gold as well as the S&P. This was highly correlated with the S&P 500. Take a look at this, guys. Boom, rally, boom, rally, boom, rally, another boom, rally. And uh, we are now having another uh, crossover, so expect a rally. But keep in mind, guys, I do believe that gold is uh, now hammering out a intermediate term top. In terms of targets, expect gold to top right around 175. That's my expectation. I expect this rally to fail here with a negative divergence on the PPO to play out to the downside. Now, in terms of a buy target, I do want to see this gap filled at 160. That will be my entry for gold. Personally, I'll be loading the boat on gold because I think the economy is weakening and deals are going down, both of which are bullish uh, drivers for gold prices. TLT, here it is. 
uh, we had this uh, support level. We came very close to hitting my target of 98 and a half. We came down to 99 and a half. Unfortunately, we did not quite get down to my level. So I'll be watching for something that looks like this, a double top negative divergence and uh, the TLT to go back down, something that uh, looks like that perhaps in February and to enter TLT at that point in time. Let's take a look at the DXY. The DXY has been putting in a significant bottom here. Look at this, a rounded bottom. We had this descending wedge pattern. It broke out, but very, very measly, pathetic breakout. Then we moved sideways for a prolonged period of time. It still looks super, super weak. And then we had this bearish engulfing candle. Uh, so we could see something that looks like this, guys. Double bottom, higher low on the PPO, and that could mark a intermediate bottom for the dollar. Uh, watch for a bounce off, uh, let's see, 101.2, this level right here. Assuming this level fails on a rally in the market where the dollar goes down there, forms a double bottom formation on the PPO at least, and that could drive uh, the S&P higher. And as the dollar turns, yields move up, the dollar turns up, the Fed raises rates. Look at this, it, it works perfectly uh, towards the end of January as the Fed raises rates in February. For example, if the Fed surprises with a half percentage point uh, rate hike instead of a 25%, basis points we could see the dollar shoot up yields shoot up and that could uh, push the market significantly down in february and in march and finally giving us that bottom in the tlt to enter as well as that pullback significant pullback in gold to enter let's take a look at another chart xly divided by xlp another chart that i shared regularly in the trading community i talked about this significant descending look at this descending triangle structure in fact if you watch my uh, last video i talked exactly about this the psychology behind this guys is that the bears get more courageous shorting at lower and lower levels pushing it down the bulls hold 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 then they finally break down and they give up then the bears take over and now we're forming somewhat of a double bottom we could see a nice counter trend rally in consumer discretionary xly guys is consumer discretionary xlp is consumer staples this looks at the risk taking appetite in the market so this is a key key chart to look at if we see something that looks like that uh, for example leading into cpi j powell comes out xly gets uh, whacked to the downside we get a double bottom a higher low on the ppo and boom we rally on cpi that would be an amazing amazing opportunity to go long for a short term long trade if that happens now let's take a look at apple guys by the way uh, apologies if i sound different i had to re-record the last 10 minutes of the video because a mosquito landed on my mic and i had to smack it in the face uh, so apologies about that guys mosquitoes suck uh let's get back to this let's take a look at apple i wanted to point out a few really really uh key key developments that i noticed on apple first off we have this obvious very clean descending channel that apple respected throughout 2022 right up until it completely lost all respect for the channel in uh, late July, right? We had this euphoric run in Apple. It failed at this obvious, very clean resistance line. Then uh, Apple sort of lost its leadership and then it continued to go down. Now to my eyes, guys, this looks like boom, a Wyckoff topping formation. Now, if you guys are not aware, a Wyckoff topping formation, is a kind of a complex topping formation where the market uh, rallies to the upside, moves up slightly, then it rallies again, forms a plateau, goes down, has one final hurrah moment, and then comes back down, forming somewhat of a shoulder-like uh, pattern, then completely collapse. Now, Tesla has this exact type of Wyckoff distribution pattern that broke completely to the downside very recently. Let's take a look at it. Here it is, guys. It looks eerily similar to the top in Apple. We have this rally markup phase. Then we have the distribution phase, a euphoric top. It gets tested once, twice, three times, comes back down, forms lower high, and boom, 
breaks. Now take a look at Apple guys. Does it not look eerily similar? We have this markup phase, distribution phase, tags, this resistance line once, twice, three times, has this anemic rally, then breaks down. Look at that. Markup phase, distribution, once, twice, three times, anemic rally, then comes back down. Apple right now is here. This is where Apple is right now. We're almost on the cusp of the collapse of Apple, at least according to uh, what I'm seeing in the fractals. Whether that happens or not is going to depend entirely on Apple's 2022 earnings results, which the company is going to report uh, in a couple of weeks, in fact. Now, I'm not a gambling man. I do not like to trade earnings. Look at this coming out uh, February 1st. So not a couple of weeks, three weeks from now. Um, and that coincides with the uh, Fed meeting. So a lot of uh, bearish developments. If we see something like this in Apple, dwindles back down, comes into February, then collapses, finally breaks through this uh, prior support line. Look at this, support, 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 support. If it finally breaks through it, it becomes resistance yet again. And we can expect Apple to go all the way down to 100 bucks by March. Now, my longer term target on Apple is actually $80 by sometime in October, probably October, maybe, maybe uh, uh, the middle of the summer, perhaps. But September, October, I expect Apple to hit $80. Let's take a look at some other stocks. Let's take a look at Amazon. A lot of um, you legends in the trading community did ask me a lot about Amazon and Google, so I'll cover those uh, very quickly here. This is Amazon, has somewhat of a similar looking uh, look, right? Markup phase, distribution, tags once, twice, comes uh, short the third time, collapses, comes short again, collapses again. We are now at very long-term support that should hold 86 bucks should hold if it doesn't then we have uh uh 67 dollars on amazon now amazon may have bottomed here it is possible that amazon has bottomed as you all know guys in a bear market uh the stocks that are top first are also the stocks that bottom first so it is a, it is possible but in my assessment we uh, will likely see Amazon go uh, down further to uh, the $70 range, a uh, high 60s by October. That's just my assessment. I just I just see a, a little bit more downside ahead for Amazon. Now, this is Google. Again, uh, this is marked up from uh, uh, the last time I recorded the video when that nasty mosquito landed on my mic. So uh, we have this uh, very clear support level. By the way, guys, uh, I did have a bear flag drawn out months, months ago, by the way, guys. This support uh, level here, this green box, I actually drew out this box at least two months ago. In fact, if you go to my earlier videos, you will see this exact green box. It's been sitting there for months and months and months. Why? Because we have this very clear accumulation area that we have now hit twice Form the double bottom with a positive divergence. So I do expect uh, Google to rally somewhere, uh, topping somewhere around, let's see, uh, 92 bucks, somewhere around there perhaps, and then failing. Uh, again, that will depend on earnings. I do have a longer term downside target for Google and it sits, boom, at 76 and at $70. So this is an accumulation zone in my view. And if you want to be a long-term investor, you might want to look at Google at this level. I know for me, it will be very attractive at that level. Now let's take a look at breadth. This is the percent of stocks in the S&P 500 trading above their 50 day moving average. And I did notice something very interesting after putting in a major bear market uh, top. In every bear market rally, we had this retest that failed around the 70% uh, percent level, where 70% of S&P 500 stocks were trading above the 50-day moving average. We had that fail here, another failure here, and we are now very close to that, perhaps a day or two away from that. Now, imagine this. Imagine we rally to $390 on the S&P, perhaps $395, something around uh, uh, those levels. 
We hit 70, perhaps we move slightly higher than that, 75, let's say, 73. And then we begin to see the rally stall and breath begin to move down. That will mark a top. Now, interestingly, we do have um, a very, very uh, interesting development on the PPO. We're almost at a bullish crossover. We had a similar look here. We almost crossed over and then we had the failure of that rally ahead of CPI. And what do we have next week, guys? We have CPI Thursday. So just be careful. CPI could establish a new uptrend or completely collapse this uh, bear market counter trend rally. Now, let's take a look at the McClellan Volume Summation Index. This is the McClellan Volume Summation Index. Below it is the oscillator. Up top is the New York Stock Exchange Composite Index. And down below is the S&P 500 in blue and black. So what are we uh, looking at here? A lot of jargon. What I'm looking at, guys, is this. We have a bullish crossover on the summation index. Now, these crossovers usually establish a trend. A cross down establishes a downtrend, and a cross up establishes an uptrend in the stock market. Now, unfortunately, we do have uh, periods of time where the market just crosses down and up and down and up, and it just moves sideways and consolidates. The uh, time period was back here, guys, crosses down and up and down and up, and it just consolidates, and it annoys everybody. So, as of right now, I do not know if we're going to see something that looks like this. Period of consolidation and weakness, period of consolidation of, uh, and weakness, or an uptrend. For an uptrend, you would want to see the black line forming distance between itself and the purple line. The larger the distance is, the stronger the uptrend. You also want to see this stay green for a while. You do not want to see it uh, go green and then red and green and red and a, a, a mishmash of mess. Same thing here, guys. You want to see it go green for a while uh, for a nice uptrend. So just keep that in mind. In my opinion, what will make or break this upcoming uh, uptrend is CPI Thursday as well as Jay Powell's remarks on Tuesday. Let's take a look at the put to call ratio. This is the PC put to call ratio. This is um, my take on the put to call ratio, uh, my proprietary uh, take on it, my levels. I put on a five day moving average on it. I put uh, up uh, a bunch of trend lines on it. Now, interestingly, uh, something very peculiar is happening. Look at this, guys. Look at this. We had a top right shoulder, left shoulder, and it marked the bottom. Look at this now, top, left shoulder, top, right shoulder, and it could perhaps mark a short-term bottom. We don't know yet, but it certainly looks like it. Now, if the PC goes all the way down to uh, tag this prior resistance line, I want to see it bounce back up. And if I do see it bounce back up, and then I start to see on the S&P 500, perhaps something that looks like this, a lower high and a slowdown in momentum, I'll be inclined to go and put on more short positions. Let's take a look at the CPC. Again, CPC, very interesting. Now, the CPC buy and sell signal follows the following rules. Number one, for a buy signal, I need to see the CPC trade down below 1.1. We got that. Friday. Secondly, I need to see the PPO cross down. Now, if the PPO crosses down, this will trigger a buy signal on the CPC buy and sell signal. That is quite similar to this, guys. After we trigger a buy signal, we usually consolidate, form a double bottom, and then move back up. So we could see something that looks uh, like this, guys. We rally, form a double bottom, and then continue to rally. That's possible. If we get a, a CPC buy signal, that would be my expectation. Now, let's take a look at the fear and greed index by CNN. We are at 46, a neutral reading. Market momentum is rallying towards the 125-day moving average. Watch whether we are uh, rejected at this level or whether we uh, take it back. Look at this prior rejection. Usually, guys, the market does not like to repeat the same thing. So, uh, just be careful. We could overtake it and then come back down. We don't know quite yet. We'll have to see. Then we have stock price strength. It is improving. Breath is also improving. But yet again, we don't know whether we're going to get a rejection just like what we had back in September 
or whether we're going to see something more sustained that lasts for several weeks in January. Put to call ratio, um, head and shoulders top, uh, indicating that yes, a counter trend rally is coming. Market volatility got rejected off the 50 day moving average, again, indicating that complacency is back. The market is turning more bullish. Safe even demand is going down, right? Stocks are now beginning to outperform bonds and junk bond demand is going up as the yield spread between junk bonds and investment grades uh, goes down. Let's take a look at the economic calendar for next week. This is it, January 9th, Monday, consumer inflation expectations at 11 a.m. Tuesday, Fed Chair Jerome Powell, 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 Powell comes back. We'll see whether the crash further comes back to crash our market or uh, whether he just uh, says nothing and the market just keeps going up. We don't know. Uh, Thursday, inflation rate. This is the critical, critical number that everybody is going to wait for. This will make or break the rally. Again, I expect something that looks something like this. Monday, uh, a little bit of a rally Tuesday we sell off Wednesday we sell off or just stagnate and then Thursday we see perhaps a rally if CPI comes at expectations or below expectations again comes back to this theory right where the market perhaps rallies Monday stagnates and then comes back down Tuesday and Wednesday uh, something that looks a little bit like this right we like weakness ahead of CPI we like weakness ahead of CPI uh, right, it comes back to the nine day moving average here. It comes back to tag the support line. I want to see it come back and tag the support line uh, for a nice reaction to the upside on the CPI release date. Now, that's assuming CPI comes down, and I do expect CPI to come down. That is my current expectation. And that has to do with this, guys. This is the now cast by the Cleveland Fed. They're now, they're now casting CPI to come in at 6.6 .6 for December and the core CPI at uh, 5.9. Let's take a look at the expectations. Look at this. 5.9, pretty close to the forecast. 6.6, .6, pretty close to the forecast. That's good enough. I think the market will uh, react positively to that if it comes at expectations. Now, let's take a look at stock market valuations, everybody. Look at this P.E. ratio versus the historical average. We are now one full standard deviation above the uh, historical average. After the 2000 bear market, we bottomed uh, near the 0% line. After the 2008 bear market, we bottomed one full standard deviation below the zero line. For uh, the end of this bear market, I want to see us uh, backtest at least this bottom, the 2020 pandemic low, which was also the 2018 low. I want to see us tag that level again, and I'll be happy to go long for the long term at that point. Now, let's take a look at a few economic figures. First off, United States personal savings rate. Look at this. Absolutely abysmal. Look, it's just horrific. Look at the savings rate. Absolutely horrific, completely collapsing in 2022 with inflation eating away at everybody's savings. Absolutely horrific looking figure. I mean, do you expect a bull market where when everybody, when almost nobody has money to buy anything? I mean, do you really expect a bull market? Do you really expect a healthy uh, economy when everybody is, uh, is really running out of money? barely can afford food, barely can afford rent. I'm sorry, I just don't see it. I do not see this being bullish at all. And it's not just the savings rate. Take a look at this. Uh, Michigan current economic conditions, United States, Michigan current economic conditions. Let's take a look at the 10-year uh, uh, chart. Look at this, absolutely abysmal, even below the 2020 pandemic low. This is the University of Michigan current economic conditions sub-index, and it's absolutely looking horrific. If we go back 25, we're almost at the 2008 lows. Is this a healthy economy? I don't think so, guys. I don't think so. Take a look at this. United States, Kansas, Fed, Composite Index. Look absolutely horrific. Uh, as bad as the 2016 mini recession, as bad as the, uh, almost as bad as early 2008. We're on our way. We're on our way to the 2020 pandemic low. We're pretty much getting there, guys. Um, so uh, it, it pretty, pretty much uh, bad on all fronts. And uh, 
just keep these figures in mind, guys, when you're trading the S&P this year. It's not going to be about rates, not going to be about uh, Fed action. It will be more about earnings, recession fears, the economy slowing down. That's going to be the driving force behind the market this year. And as always, I expect the Fed to again be late with the pivot and the market to continue to collapse even after the Fed pivots. I believe this is the longest video I've ever made uh, or uploaded to YouTube. So please, guys, slap that like button. This took me ages to finish, record, edit, research. It just took me ages and ages and ages. So, so thank you guys for watching all the way through. Thank you so much. Um, the best way you can support me if you watch these videos is just by leaving a like. I would really appreciate it. That's all I have for you today, guys. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll catch you in the next one. And Happy New Year, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs> oh, wow!